Well, hello there. It is 12 o'clock on Tuesday, and you know what that means? That means that it is time for this week's Ask Shelly segment. I am Shelly Fan Fan, and I am your emotional intelligence expert. I'm a licensed psychotherapist here, CEO and owner of Ask Shelly Consulting LLC, where we help corporations get to their next level to attain peak performance through the provision of psychoeducation. I have the privilege every week of joining with all of you and sharing a question that is asked of me. Psychotherapists are asked questions all the time because we always wanna know about humans, why we think the way we think, the why we decide the way we decide, why we act the way that we act, how are we motivated and why are we motivated that way? And so, Several months ago, actually, oh my God, last August, I started to share questions with all of you and you guys become my consultation team. So please feel free to chime in, share your thoughts, share your feedback. It may not be the answers, but feedback is very valuable. My hope and my prayer is that people can take away tools tools that they can deposit into their wellness toolbox. And whether it's, if it's for you, great. If it's not for you, you can share it with a loved one, right? And hopefully it'll benefit them. I appreciate your shares. So if you are here uh, live with me on Facebook, I do appreciate your shares. Let's get the word out. Let's get the answers out. And I'll be sharing my questions in just a few moments. I'm actually going to log in myself and share and see who's on. I'm using a different platform, so it's always not it's not always easy for me to see who's on. Please let me know who's on. Comment in the comment section. Let me know where you are tuning in from. Again, I do appreciate your feedback. So when I ask the question, I would love for you to share your thoughts, okay? And so let me go back over to Instagram here. I don't see any red lights or yellow lights or green lights. So I am going to assume, let me make sure I didn't miss anything. I am going to assume that everybody here on Instagram is killing it, that you are in full throttle green mode, your kids are situated, you got your, you're productive every day, you're not gaining 100 pounds, you're, you're good, right? And if not, then you can, get and take advantage of a free consultation with Ash Shelley calling 407-350-5070. I'm here to be of service to this community and beyond because we will, we shall get through this. Okay. Hi, Crystal. Hi, Anissa. Thank you so much for joining on today. So you guys are part of my consultation team today. You will not get paid, so don't try to invoice me, but I'd love to hear your feedback. Are we ready? Let me pull up the question here. This week's Ask Shelly question. Dear Ask Shelly, I am completely fed up with my 14-year-old daughter, and so is my husband. We are fed up with her and each other to the point where we want to escape from each other. There is no harmony in our home and being confined to the home is driving us all crazy. It is the same scenario that plays itself out over and over and over again. My daughter acts up, we try to discipline her, she pushes back against the discipline, my husband and I argue about how to address the issue, so we start fighting and yelling. We fight so bad that we often forget what caused us to get angry with one another in the first place. By the time days go by and my husband and I finally start talking, whatever my daughter was in trouble for flies right out of the window until it happens again. I am exhausted by this cycle, however, I want to save my marriage at the same time. Please help. All right, Instagram, where are my console, my consultation partners? Hi, Eric. Hi, Eric. Hi, Troy. Thank you so much for joining in. Hello, Lucinda. I don't know if I missed anybody. I'm using a new system here, so I hope I didn't. Thank you so much for tuning into this week's Ask Shelly segment. I need your feedback. I will be repeating the question. 
I need your feedback. This is a mother that's saying, you know what? My daughter's behavior is so out of hand right now that we're about to get a divorce. Like our marriage is close to being over. I need some help. And this is why she is writing in. So I'd love to hear your feedback. I will repeat the question and we're going to jump right in. Dear Ash Shelley, I am completely fed up with my 14 year old daughter. And so is my husband. Who on here know what that feels like? Any parent ever been completely fed up with their child or is that a new thing? Does that, does that know? No one knows what that is like? Let me know, talk to me. We are fed up with her and each other to the point where we want to escape from each other. There is no harmony in our home and being confined to the home is driving us all crazy. Anybody going crazy because of family issues that were pre-existing and now they're like so animated and so loud because now you're confined with one another? This is why we don't sweep things under the rug. Okay, here we go. It is the same scenario that plays itself out over and over and over again. My daughter acts up, we try to discipline her. I don't know about that try. It's either you're disciplining her or you're not. What's up with trying? Okay, we, we're either disciplining or we're not. Okay, here we go. My daughter acts up, we try to discipline her. She pushes back against the discipline. My husband and I argue about how to address the issue, so we start fighting and yelling. We fight so bad that we often forget what caused us to get angry with one another in the first place. By the time days go by and my husband and I finally start talking, whatever my daughter was in trouble for flies right out of the window until it happens again. I am exhausted by this cycle. However, I want to save my marriage at the same time. Please help. So one of the things that I am tasked to do as a psychotherapist when there are people, that clients that come into the office for help, right? They come in for help is listen to the presenting problem, but also understanding that what the person believes is the presenting problem may not be. As a matter of fact, oftentimes what people come in and declare as the problem is not necessarily so. So I'll give you an example, someone that comes in for procrastination, right? And then based on my assessment, based on what I'm hearing, based on my findings, the issue is not procrastination, the issue is your attention deficit. Or someone that comes in for anger management issues, and I find that the issue is not the anger, the issue is your unresolved trauma, right? Or when parents come in, oh, this is a classic one. When parents come in because they want us, they want me to fix their child, but ultimately the problem is not the behavior per se, but the parenting. I say all that to say, the first thing that we have to determine is what is happening? What is happening here, right? That is very important for us to be able to determine. Are we looking at a behavioral issue that we need to be, uh, we need to declare that as the root of the problem, right? Let's declare that as the root of the problem and let's treat that. Are there multiple things going on here? And if there are multiple things going on, let's prioritize how we're going to address them with the most severe first. Are we gonna go with the less severe first? So what is happening? And so what is happening, my consultation team, is something that is called splitting. That is the behavior, it is splitting. Now I know that mom wants to address what, whatever it is that she never says what the behavior is. She doesn't say if the if the if her daughter is cursing, if there's promiscuity, if she's cutting, if she's stealing. It's never said in this question exactly what it is, but because we have to, for the purpose of this Ask Shelley segment, pick our focus, it's splitting. So let's talk about splitting for a second, right? So splitting is a form of something called triangulation. And for those of you who have heard it, please chime in. Let me know, yeah, I know what that is. My kids do it to us all the time, me and my husband or me and my wife. And so splitting is a form of triangulation. And this is when someone uses manipulation to drive the nature of communication with two other people that are a part of the triangle, okay? So let's define who's a part of this triangle in this question that I just asked. So we have who? Who's the part of the triangle? Instagram, 
Who's going to get the no prize? Huh? Facebook, what's the triangle? The triangle is child, mother, father, right? Who's the manipulator here? Child. <laughs> this, she has learned to split, right? To manipulate the nature of the communication between the parents. And so there are many different forms of triangulation that we see in that particular you know, scenario where it's parents and child, where sometimes the parent may be the manipulator, causing the child to be in the middle, You know, tell your mom I said this, tell your dad I said this. But in this particular case, the child becomes the manipulator and through that manipulation is able to drive the nature of the communication between the parents. And we call that splitting, right? And so she's successfully splitting the parents to assure that they are not on the same page. So we said that we have to start somewhere. We have to understand exactly what is happening and what is happening is this thing called splitting. I want to also understand how that happens. Like how does the person get the parents to split? Well, we create a situation where we, um, by the through that manipulation, there are roles that are successfully assigned. There are roles that are assigned. And if you allow yourself to be manipulated, you will adopt a role. What are those roles, right? We're talking about a triangle. So there are three roles. The first role is the victim, then the villain, and then a rescuer. Okay, that's the triangle. Talk to me if you're getting this. I hope you're taking notes. What's the triangle? What is the triangle? Lucinda says, these parents need to realize they are a partnership. First work on that and they can co-parent effectively. Lucinda, you have been officially hired. Yes. So this is what we said, right? We're talking about splitting. So are we going to work on the child's behavior? Are we going to work on the child's behavior right now? Where do we need to start Instagram? Where do we need to start Facebook? Right? We need to start with the parents. That's awesome. Crystal says the parents definitely need to talk first. Discipline second. Yes. So good. Crystal, you got into my notes for today, didn't you? That's so awesome. We have to get the parents on the same page first. And Eric says, is Jesus in the home? And these are the things that we just don't know, right? Because the questions sometimes are so vague. I know Stefan here on um, Instagram once said, how can you even answer or provide feedback when you don't have all the pieces? And it's difficult. So we take what we have and we do the best that we can. And Eric says, is the daughter both parents biological parent. That's a good one because that changes some dynamic, right? Is the daughter um, adopted or is it, is it the biological daughter of mom, but not dad's or vice versa? And this is information, Eric, unfortunately, that's not necessarily included in the question. I try my best not to necessarily ask too much when people do write in because I have to protect myself as a licensed psychotherapist to not enter into what can be viewed as a client, you know, therapist relationship. So a lot of the times when I'm presenting this feedback, it's based on little information that's been provided. So we talked about first having to define exactly what is happening. And then we have to determine when it happens. Because in order to get to the why, we have to know exactly when it happens. And it seems like it often happens when? When they have to discipline the child, when something has gone wrong, when there has been some expectation that has not been met this is when this happens, right? So we know that the trigger to this, this conflict between the parents is what? When they are having to discipline the daughter. So we know what is happening. It's called splitting. We know when it happens, right? And it happens when they have to discipline the child. Now we have to go to the, why does it happen? Why does the splitting happen? So I want you to get your notes out. There are four reasons why behaviors happen, especially when we're talking about maladaptive behaviors in our children. There are four reasons why they happen. So I want every parent on Instagram and every parent here on Facebook with me to think about a behavior, a maladaptive one, something that really needs to be modified, something that your child does that just drives you nuts. I want you, I want to take some time. I want you to think about that behavior. Okay. And when you got that behavior in your head, 
I want you to give me a thumbs up. Say, I got it. Just say, I got it. I got the behavior. I got it. Oh, we got some. Okay. So we have Keegan 1924 here on Instagram saying it's hard when parents are separated. Very good. Um, let's see. Uh, Stefan says the daughter needs an old school Haitian beating. I should not have um, read that because we don't beat children. We disciple them. We don't punish them. We disciple them, right? And disciple is teaching. Thank you very much. <laughs> so, okay. Let me go back over here. We got our thumbs up. Okay. We got our thumbs up. So now that behavior that you have in your mind, okay, Keegan1924 has his thumbs up here. So there are four reasons why this behavior is happening. One of four could be a combination. First, for escape avoidance. So for those of you who like acronyms, think of the acronym EATS, E-A-T-S. And the E stands for escape and avoidance. So that means this behavior happens because it provides me an opportunity to escape and avoid, right? So let me see. An example of that is a tantrum from a child. Let's say a tantrum is, or tantrum is the behavior that we are targeting in this scenario. So I tantrum during homework so I can escape or avoid this non-preferred activity that I have to complete. Okay, that's an example of escape avoidance. The second is attention, right? The second reason why behaviors happen is for attention. And so I throw a tantrum because this is the only time that my parents attend to me. We have individuals like the only time my parents attend to me is when there's this big catastrophe at school. So I engage in cutting because this is the only time that I can get my uh, lawyer mom and my doctor dad to sit at a table and actually attend to me. And so this cutting happens for the function of attention, right? So we have escape avoidance, we have attention, and then we have the T, which is tangible. That means that I act this way because I get something tangible out of it. I get something that I want out of it, something tangible. So um, I tantrum at Toys R Us because I know my parent is going to give in and I'm going to walk out with that remote control card. Get that? And then the S is for sensory. And this one is when we behave or we, we do things because there's some sensory stimulation. Um, so we see a lot of sensory stimulated behaviors with children with autism, that headbang as a result of the sensory stimulation that it provides, or gum picking is an example of that. Uh, we have even individuals, teens that do cut sometimes, it's for sensory where the actual feeling of the pain is very reinforcing or the taste of the blood. That's again, that's a sensory uh, stimulation. So we have E-A-T-S, behaviors happen for escape avoidance, behaviors happen for attention, Behaviors happen because I get something out of it or it feels good. What is, why is the splitting happening, guys? Let me see how well you guys are, how good you guys are. I know you're getting it. My class is good today. So we know that the behavior is splitting. We know that it happens, right? The child engages in splitting when she's being disciplined for something that has happened, right? An expectation she hasn't met. So why is the splitting happening? Drum roll, please. All right, Crystal, yay, you got it. It's happening for escape avoidance. She has learned to successfully <laughs> escape and avoid punishment. And so the parents are wondering, why is this happening? And my marriage is going all over the place and blah, 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 blah. Well, she has successfully done it. It works. The stealing works. The sneaking out of the house is working. We have to assure that the way that our children are accessing our attention or escape avoiding or, or trying to communicate through work, you know, if, communicate through their behavior, what they're not able to communicate with their work, we have to make sure that they're not successful in, a, in, in engaging in maladaptive behavior to get it. So we, again, so we talked about what is happening, when it's happening, and why it's happening. And so then we have to figure out what we're focusing our attention on, right? What are we gonna focus our attention on? We're gonna focus our attention on skill deficit. 
almost always when we're dealing with an issue, especially, especially an issue that deals with a behavioral issue, we can almost always find a skill deficit. And in this particular case, the skill deficit is with the parents. It's with the parents. The parents have to learn to communicate, right? They have to be able to effectively communicate about consequences that they are going to impose and, and to their daughter. They have to be able to say, when this happens, this is what we'll do. And when this happens, this is what we'll do. And when this happens, this is what we'll say. And when this happens, this you will take care of it this way. When this happens, you will take care of it. It's a conversation. And when we have these conversations in advance, we are not parenting out of emotions. Emotions go up, emotions go down. Sometimes we're happy, sometimes we're not so happy. Sometimes we're calm, sometimes we're very irritable, right? And so we don't want our parenting to follow those emotion, that emotional wave, right? So you catch me on a good day. And the fact that you snuck out last night, give me your phone for a couple of hours, it ain't no big deal. I'm feeling good today. Another day you catch me uh, at a certain time of the month and it's like, give me your phone and you're not sleeping on your bed, you sleep on the floor, you eat bread and water all day, right? We don't want our parenting to become emotional because parenting is only effective when it's consistent. Parenting is only effective when it is consistent. Parenting is only effective when it is consistent. And consistency means that we as husband and wife are responding to these behavioral issues in the same way in the same fashion, yes? Crystal says separating the emotions remove the bias because it's not about how it feels. It's not about how I feel, it's about you. Excellent, let me repeat that. Crystal here on Facebook says, separating the emotion removes the bias because it's not about how I feel, it's about you. And that is important that we are not emotionally parenting. I start my sessions because I do um, traveling and, and, and do parenting conferences for the National House of Hope. And I always start by saying this, there's no such thing as good or bad parenting. It's either that it's either it's effective or ineffective. And effective parenting is birthed out of skills. And I, I didn't learn how to communicate from my parents. That wasn't, that's a skill that I acquired later because Haitian parenting is a whole nother manual that I can't, we'll be here for 15 hours if I break down Haitian parenting. Can a Haitian person give me an amen, okay? So there were things that I had to learn, right? And so again, effective parents is birthed out of skillful parenting. An effective style of parenting could be good for your son, but that same effective parenting style may not be effective for your, your younger son or your older son or your daughter, right? Children are different. Their personalities are different. Their maturity levels are different. They learn differently. And so we have to be able to adapt our parenting style to the differences in our children. So when we're talking about how to address this question with this woman who is saying, help me, I don't know what else to do. We need to work on getting you and your husband on the same page to really take a look at your parenting style and his and how that impacts one another. We have people that have been have come out of homes where there's a very rigid style of parenting. And so they're not trying to talk to their kids. Like we're not gonna sit down and have a conversation with Johnny about what he thinks we should do about his behavior, right? I always say children support what they help create. You can, you can let them come in on this conversation about, okay, if this happened, this is, what, this is what's gonna happen. A lot of parents are very rigid. No, I am not allowing my child to play a part in their disciplinary action. I'm not sitting and having a conversation. I'm not reinforcing my child with money or, or edibles for something that they should be doing anyway. You know, there are parents that are very rigid that way. There are parents that are very passive and not very present. We have parents that are very democratic. They talk to, talk to their children. They make sure that they have open communication. They make sure that there is, you know, th those processes in place, like I just talked about, involving your children in that disciplinary process. And so taking a look at the husband's parenting style versus the wife's parenting style 
And finding a, a, a middle ground is really important. And, and that's really hard to do without a third party, especially if they're arguing and they have not been able to achieve effective communication. This is when you go to a therapist. You go to a third party, someone that has experience in behavioral change, in behavioral analysis, in just behavior transformation, someone that understands those principles and can sit and help you with choosing the parenting style that works best for the both of you. It's a middle ground. It's not going to be we're defaulting to this parenting style or this, but we've created this is the best parenting style to deal with the, the behavioral concerns that you have for this child. It has to be that specific. So because you parent this way and because you parent this way, this is what we're going to adopt to address the behavioral issues for this child. And that is very difficult, again, to do when you have not achieved effective communication. So getting a third party to help with that process is key. All right, let me take a look at what you guys say. Making sure that I haven't missed anyone. Thank you so much again for tuning in. Thank you for your feedback. Okay, now I want us to also not assume that we're not going to address the behavior for the child. And while we're talking about parenting and we're talking about the importance of that, of course, I want to make sure that I have an opportunity to say this because I work with adolescents all the time and I understand that they um, often use behavior as a form of communication. They often use behavior as a form of communication. So having said that, we need to take a look at whatever is happening. Remember, she didn't share that. So I really don't know what the behavior is, but behavior is language. And so a lot of the times I find myself working with parents to help them decode this language. What is your child saying when she does this? When she isolates, what is she saying here, right? And so really taking a look at what's happening, what that behavior is, what that behavioral language is, what is she really trying to say? What is she responding to? And then I always start the process of really looking into the behavior. This is after we've established, right? We've established, we got the parents on the same page, consequences are in order. And then we also then take a look at some of the emotional pieces that have to be there. How much quality time is this child getting with each of you separately? And what does quality time look like? For those of you who tune in on a regular basis, you know, I have always said consistently that quality is about three forms of contact happening at one time. Eye contact, skin contact, verbal contact. When are you having that with your child? And I'm not saying like we as a family go out. I'm taking, I'm talking about taking it a step further when mom is having that one-on-one -on -one quality time with daughter and separate and apart, dad is having that one-on-one -on -one quality time with the daughter. It's important to take a look at that. It's important to take a look at just the harmony in the home. If there Are there any other situations going on? Are we seeing, Are we? is the behavioral manifestations um, from depression or anxiety or any some other emotional instability? So of course we would go and we would go deep into that to kind of help along because Problems are rarely unilateral. They're usually systemic, like different systems operating with or against one another. And so separating those systems out and prioritizing how we're going to address them. In this particular case, parenting is the main issue. So we have to get the parents on the same page. And after we get the parents on the same page, it is important to really take a look at what the child is saying through her behavior. What skill sets does she not have? What are we looking at there? We're looking at the quality time, the attachment between the child and the parent, so we can do that as well. Another aspect of treatment that we can definitely go down that road or something that we can address during this process is also looking at mom and dad, their marital status. A lot of times people who are experiencing marital discord have disharmony in their home and the children are responding to that. So is it really that the behavior is causing the marital issues or is the marital issues causing the behaviors that continue to exacerbate the marital issues? 
<laughs> so we have to take a look and identify that system to identify that cycle, expose it, and then eradicate it, okay? And so for mom and dad, I would love to know, what are you doing to nurture your marriage? What are you doing to maximize your intimacy? And I'm not just talking about sex, but maximizing intimacy, your conversations of care, the, uh, the time that you guys spend with one another laughing, the adventure that you have allowed into your marriage. We need healthy distance. We also need uh, adventure and diversity. We need conversations of care. We need to be able to constantly communicate about what we need and how you are meeting that need and how you are not. And so really taking a look at mom and dad and the nature of their marriage, the, the marital needs is very important because when those are when the answer is no, right? Like, are you doing anything to nurture your marriage? No. Are you doing anything to be intentional about maximizing intimacy in your marriage? No. So when the answer is no, you can expect no progress. Like how like super cuckoo is that for you to expect great things and expect healthy manifestations for things that you're not investing in? So a lot of this cliche stuff that's all cliche is, you know, is something that may save your marriage. Oh, deep breathing and decompressing and, you know, uh, maximizing intimacy and buying feathers and oils, all that stuff don't work. Well, it doesn't, how do you know it doesn't work? You're not trying it, right? And so a lot of the times our answer, our breakthrough is on the other side of something you think is dumb, on the other side of a book that you haven't read, <laughs> on the other side of a phone number that you haven't called to get therapy. So if those answers are no, you, you can expect no progress. So we talked about really taking a look at the behavior, what's truly happening, how can we fix that, how we can get the parents on the same page. And once we get them on the same page, let's go deeper into what's going on with the, with the daughter. Let's really take a look at what she's saying. When she's stealing from you, what's the message there? What is she saying there? And then really taking a look at the marriage and strengthening it. So for that person who wrote in on today, help me. I don't know what to do. I encourage you to contact Ash Shelley at info at ashshelley.com. You can also call at 407-350-5070. And when we say to call, it's not because you are electing us, but we will assist you in connecting with the provider if by chance that person or that provider is not us. Because every provider has a specialty. Every provider, you may have a vibe with them, you may not have a vibe with them. And so we don't automatically assume that the people that we consult with will choose us, but most of the time they do, <laughs> you understand. But when they don't, we are happy to connect you with the network of providers that we have linkages with. So do not try to do this on your own. A lot of the times we try to do things right on our own you know i got this well you haven't got it i mean your child is now what did she say was it 14 you haven't gotten 14 years so it's okay to to get to a point where you say i need help everybody say that with me i need help even if you don't need it i want you to say it with me i need help all right how did that feel <laughs> I'm turning this to a group session. How did that feel? I want, let me go to the comments. How did that feel? I need help. That's a hard question. Or that's a hard statement for me it is. I need help. That is like, I'm telling you that, that statement right there is, it triggers. It, it, it does, it triggers things on the inside of me. It really does, right? How, does that feel when you say, I need help? Jewel on Facebook said tough. That is. What are some other, what are some other questions that are tough? I don't know what to do. That's tough. I don't know what to do. And I want us to really start thinking, we just took a whole different turn. <laughs> Um, but I'll allow it, right? Because um, it's important. Um, it's, Im it's important for us to know what those triggering statements are so that when we are playing them automatically in our heads, that we are able to address them in a very healthy way, right? 
And so that's important. And so for this parent that wrote in, it's okay to not know what to do with your daughter. It's okay to be confused and it's okay to reach out and get help. There are trained professionals that are anointed to do this that can help you. So be encouraged, be encouraged to reach out. Jewel on Facebook says, I can't do it on my own. Woo! That's another tough one. Hey, that triggers me because I'm in a position, guys, to be very transparent with you. People rely on me to have the answers. And when I get to a point in my own personal life where I can't access those answers, it's triggering. Admitting we need help sometimes feels like we're failures. This is Lucinda on Facebook. I want to repeat that. She says, admitting we need help sometimes feels like we're failures. But you know what? You know what that admission does? It actually means that you're a victor. Because people who really have understood ask and you shall receive are the ones who are winning right now. They're the ones that actually found the person that funded their entire vision. Because while you were embarrassed to ask, they did. So admission, <laughs> admitting that we need help is empowering. I need Lysol. <laughs> Hello, world. I'm tired of going out and not finding, I need Lysol. And I know I'm joking a little bit. Actually, I'm not. I do need Lysol. But again, it's true. And we have to start to reframe that thinking. Right, Lucinda? Admitting we need help sometimes feels like failure. So fail, asking for help means I'm a failure. That statement right there, we need to learn how to reframe that, right? And there are so many automatic statements that play in our head that are problematic. And we have to be able to get it out of AutoZone and put it into our awareness because you cannot change anything that is not in your awareness. So we have to, we have to like, like uh, self-talk. Negative self-talk, that internal dialogue that's not healthy. So most of the time it happens very automatically. Like that stuff is going off and we don't even realize, but we're responding to it emotionally. And so one of the things that we have to do as therapists is get our clients to take it out of auto zone and put in our awareness that do you realize that when you procrastinate it's because this internal dialogue is happening and you're not even aware of it. That internal dialogue that tells you you can't get it done because you're not equipped that internal dialogue that makes you feel like everybody else is doing it but you. That internal dialogue that makes you feel that you have like missed out on years, years and years and it's too late. And this is the thing. Oh Lord, it's 1237. Mm, you guys are pulling on me. So our brains, I'm talking about internal dialogue here and statements that are associations that we make in our, in our heads that are not healthy. With, us, with specifically focusing on internal self-dialogue. Now, our brains respond to threats in something called survival mode, which is fight or flight. So we, we, we have to protect ourselves. We have to survive, or we got to get the heck up out of here, right? And so we understand that when we're talking about trauma, like even this pandemic, we're all in our, most people are in their survival brains right now. Right. They're in their survival brains. There is fight or flight. They're they're interpreting all external stimuli as 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 a threat is it's unsafe. You know, so even our leaders, we can't even trust our leaders because it's just not safe. We're in our survival brain that 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 innate protection to make sure that Shelly lives. <laughs> we need you to live. So we don't need you to relax right now. We need you to be on, you know, pins and needles because you got to be ready to, to fight or flight. And this is why we can't, we can't calm down and, and, and we can't just be with our families and we, cause we're like in survival mode, right? Our brains respond to threats in fight or flight mode. And when you're in fight or flight mode, you are not, you don't have the capacity or you have limited capacity to absorb new information. New information is required to change. So for people who are stuck, we have to take a look at why are you, why, what's, the, what's inhibiting, what's, what's blocking that person's capacity to absorb the new information needed to break through. Your negative self-talk is a threat. Your brain will respond to your negative self-talk as a threat. And so what happens? How does your brain respond to threats? 
How does your brain respond to threats? Fight or flight. So even your internal dialogue becomes a threat and your brain is responding to the internal your internal dialogue as a threat. And so you don't have the capacity to absorb the new information that you need to get to the other side because your internal dialogue continues to present a threat to you. Your internal dialogue that tells you it's not safe for you to take that risk or it's not good for you to go back to school because, you know, we don't want you to be rejected or listen. The, we all have our defense mechanism is designed to keep us safe. And sometimes that defense mechanism is so unhealthy because we have to get unsafe to break through. And so your that defense mechanism loves you and wants to keep you right where you are because it's totally comfortable. It's a, we know how to do obese. We've been doing obese. So this is comfortable for me to be obese, right? Because then your that defense mechanism is saying, well, no, we don't want to start doing this diet because if it fails, then we have to go through all of that emotional turmoil. So I'm going to cause this person to not be motivated enough to do the work. And so we have to be aware of how unhealthy our defense mechanisms are at times and how it can keep us bound. And part of that defense mechanism and really understanding how our defense mechanisms work is also expanding your awareness on how your internal dialogue becomes a threat causes you to respond or causes your your brain to respond in survival mode and you're not able to absorb the new information you need to break through to your next level so we got to change that self-talk we got to change those those statements that you have adopted as reality right such as asking for help means i'm a failure really taking those statements and reframing them Asking for help means that I'm confident. Asking for help means that I have wisdom. Asking for help means I'm telling the atmosphere I'm ready for more. Learning how to reframe that dialogue is so important. And you know what? I'm not going to say that you can't reframe that dialogue on your own. I will say that it is very, very difficult to do so. I'm going to give you a quick um, scenario and then we're going to close. When I was running track... I had natural talent. And so I remember the first time that the track coach saw me, I was coming from dance practice and he saw those long, very muscular legs and said, do you run track? I said, no, he's like, you've never ran before. I said, I ran from dogs when I was in New York. And I was, I mean, straight face to y'all. I was, it was true. That was how I ran. I ran from dogs coming from St. Joachim and Ann almost every day, walking home from school. That's that was it. And he was like, so you've never run before. No. He said, can you come out to practice? I would love to watch you practice. So I go out to practice and he teaches me the triple jump. I break the record right there. He's like, you got to join the team. I break the record. Just natural talent. Just natural talent. And so I'm sprinting, doing the hundred, just like killing it without even trying. So here it is. It's the day that we have to now. Um, this is my first track meet. And I see these blocks that they put on the floor. I'm like, what in the world is this? <laughs> like, we've never practiced with me coming out of blocks. And so I was like, I told the coach, I can't, I can't do this. You're going to have to remove the blocks. Is there any way I can run without coming out the blocks? He's like, it's so easy. Just put your feet up against this and, you know, go down on your knees. And I'm like, but I haven't, I have, we haven't done this. We haven't practiced this. Like, I don't want to come out of these blocks. So he's like, okay. He talks to the judges, whatever. They remove the blocks. That was the worst thing he could ever done. Because once I knew that I could win without the blocks, I continued to run without the blocks. But this was the thing. I could have blown people out of the water, Facebook and Instagram. I could have blown my opponents out of the water. Easy, just natural talent. <laughs> had I been, had I just got uncomfortable and use the blocks because what was happening was because everybody else was using the blocks and I was much faster than them, I had to use so much more energy to catch up because they were coming out of the starting line much faster than me. And so I had to use so much more energy to catch up and then blow them out the water. But by that time, I had used so much energy because I wasn't using the blocks. <laughs> the blocks could have, it would have helped me to beat them from the get, right? But I hated it and I got so used to the accommodation, I got so used to doing it the hard way that I continued to do it 
the hard way. And eventually it got to a point where it just stopped working for me. People were, they found that the delay that it was causing me to not come out of the blocks was what I was losing by. Like five seconds here, three seconds here. And I didn't advance to, to regionals. But anyway, I'm saying all this to say, can you learn how to reframe your thoughts and your statements and your internal dialogue on your own? I would never be the one to say, no, you cannot. But I will say that, why, if you can do it easier, if, there, if you can partner with someone that is able to guide you through that process, why would you put an extra five years on your progress or another three failed relationships or another birthday where you feel like you haven't achieved it? Like what, why? Just be vulnerable enough to partner with someone to help you through. It's like those blocks. I worked way too hard <laughs> to win those races where all I needed to do was get uncomfortable and learn how to come out those blocks. And so those blocks for you guys that are really dealing with feeling stuck and being stuck is just aligning yourself with someone who's anointed and experienced to take you to your next level. I am Shelly Fan Fan. <sighs> So, so, so privileged to spend this time with you guys every Tuesday. CEO and founder of Ash Shelley Consulting. You can reach me at info at ashshelley.com. You can call 407-350-5070. I definitely invite you to subscribe to my YouTube channel. Go over to YouTube and subscribe, Ask Shelley. And for those of you who need further support and you need some individual support or family support or couple support, email info at askshelly.com. We'll be happy to help you to break through to your next level. Thank you so much for tuning into this week's Ask Shelly segment. Be blessed, be powerful, be well in this season and understand and know with all certainty that this too shall pass. <laughs>